But if you have any questions, please use the chat feature. Um, thanks to Centerpoint Fire for hosting this again, as always. Um, the first part is going to be the protocols. We're going to go over it, and then we'll go back and do. Um, I got some stimmies, uh, some 12 leads to look at, and then a good trauma case to go over. For your certificate today, uh, email is using the roster email Alabama EMS challenge at gmail.com. Chief Ward also put a link up in the chat box, I do believe. Get your kind ed. Um, we'll try to get this back to you within a week or so, but remember, um, we also have other jobs as well. Sometimes it takes a few days to get that back to you, but we will get the certificates out to you. Try to email us back, fill out the form by this afternoon. I'd like to thank Rams and Brian Gober for getting this PowerPoint set um, put up for us. Some of this stuff is on the BRIMS webpage. Um, remember, is the protocol training for the first hour. There's no way that one hour is going to give you the information you need to understand all the concepts of this. And uh, some of these new things we're going to go over are skill sets. So make sure that you practice these, train on these, on mannequins, and get some oversight before you do these skills and procedures. So reach out to your offline medical director all right, for some advice on that stuff and reach out to your training officer. All right, so things that have changed. We got OG tubes that we're allowed to use now for EMT uh, for paramedics. We got blind insertion. Sorry, sir. Blind insertion devices. We got BiPAP. We're going to talk about some eyesight changes for kids less than two. We've changed the wording. You can use blind insertion devices for pediatrics now. We're talking about some hemodialysis changes, chest decompression, and a few medication changes as well. All right, so the first thing we're talking about is OG2 placement. So for those of you that are uh, nurses or working online, or watching online that work in the hospital, um, we use OG tubes all the time as an airway management device, okay? This is being pushed out for EMS or pre-hospital use as well. It's a great way to help protect the airway even if somebody that's intubated. What an OG tube does is it basically decompresses the belly. If you think about it, anybody that you use a blind insertion device on or a bag valve mask, you can put air in the belly. It distends the belly, pushes up on the diaphragm, makes it harder for you to ventilate someone, and it also makes it more commonly vomit and aspirate, okay? OG tubes, they got two lumens in them. One is a big lumen with numerous ports. This should go into the stomach. It can be used to pull out chunks of food, secretions. There's another smaller lumen that we put on there as well, and that's kind of like a release valve, so this does not get stuck to the stomach or the esophagus long term and cause damage. Really not going to see that happen in the uh, pre-hospital setting for the short amount of time we have them, but it is a kind of a safety valve, okay? But these are NG tubes, OG tubes. We're not going to place them nasally in the pre-hospital environment. Um, we're going to place them all orally, all right? So the way this works is if I got somebody that even is intubated, so cardiac arrest, we arrive on scene, we're doing high quality CPR, we intubate, <clears throat> During CPR, we get an ET2 placed, we got the cuff up in the trachea. A lot of people think we have a secure airway, and we do within reason, but you also got to remember that that belly is going to be full of fl fluid, food, air, all right, and there's still a risk for secretions to get in and the patient to aspirate. So by placing an OG tube, it bypasses all this, tube goes into the stomach, we decompress the stomach, we get the air out, the vomit out. You get better lung compliance because the diaphragm is not pushed up real high, and you also help prevent aspiration. It's a great airway management device. There have been times when I've gone to intubate somebody, I've looked, airway is full of vomitus, it's tough to get them tubed. I don't get it on first pass, but I'll do is I'll place an OPA, slide an engine tube around that, hook suction, ventilate for a few minutes, then go and intubate. If you got one hole plugged with an OG tube, it makes it a lot easier to get the tube in the right place as well. So OG tubes are very uh, relatively easy to use. There's a limited risk to these things and a good benefit. People that don't need OG tubes, if you have someone who's penetrating neck trauma, someone shot in the neck or stabbed in the neck, you don't place an OG tube. Reason being, if they have a hole, an artificial pathway from being shot, and now the esophagus is torn, and you place that OG tube, you can go into that false track and run it into the chest cavity or somewhere else, and that's poor form. So penetrating neck trauma, you do not get OG tubes, all right? Now, in the hospital, a lot of times you see us place an NG tube, okay? And that's good so that later on down the road, when we extubate these people, they still have gastric decompression, 
and we don't have to pull that tube. Obviously, you don't put anything in anybody's nose that has spatial trauma. There's a chance of passing that tube up into the cranium, which is poor form. So relatively, 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 it's not even a word. Realistically, I don't place NG tubes. I do all OG tubes in the ER. All right. Any questions, comments, statements within reason, just put them on the chat box. My caffeine titer is a little bit too low this morning, so don't be shy. We're adding blind insertion devices for the scope of EMT. That is the national scope of practice change that the state started last week for us, which is fantastic. I think in the near future, we're going to see that blind insertion devices are going to almost kind of replace oral airways for a lot of these things. I'm a big fan of the iGel. We'll talk about that and the King. There are numerous ones on the market. There's an AirQ. There's some LMAs out there. Um, whatever your medical director thinks is appropriate, that's fine. Uh, I think the iGel is the better device, but that's my opinion. Yes, hey, sir. Yeah, just to clarify, everybody, the uh, attendance form just came online to get your to get your uh, certificate for this class. You can email Alabama EMS at gmail.com. You get an automated return email with a link to the attendance form. I'll be putting the attendance form up in the Q&A box here in a minute. We've had a flood of questions come in about that this morning. And Dr. Ferguson is repeating some protocol um, information over the last few sessions. But each session uh, has new information in it and counts as separate con ads. You can get credit for every session that you attend. Sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. No, that's great. Great. Yeah, so we've done, this is our third protocol class. Each one has been a little bit different. I've changed the videos up. I've added a few things to each of them, taken some things away. Again, there's no way to get all the information you need in 60 minutes. Um, so I would recommend that you go to the BRIMS webpage in the BRIMS region. There are different videos on there in regards to chest decompression, the different types of airways that are out there, the blind insertion devices, how you use those. Look at that. Then when you have questions about that, go to Dr. Google, look those things up. All right. And after that, you talk to your training officer and your offline medical director and you practice those skills and you work that way. In the BRIMS region, if you're a non-transporting agency and you need help with any of these skills, reach out to me at BRIMS. I'm happy to come out. We can take care of that. That's part of my job. If you're a transporting agency, okay, reach out to your offline medical director. If you need help finding a medical director, reach out to me. We can find somebody for you. All right. So the King Airway is probably the most common. It's been out for a while. If you look at some of the online videos with the King insertions, a lot of people are even using the Rendoscope blades is they place the king um, that kind of defeats the purpose at the EMT scope or practice level. These things can place, be placed blindly. We'll watch a video here in a second. But in short, the way this works is you have a semi bite block here. You have two balloons, one that sits in the hypopharynx, one that sits in the distal esophagus. In between those two balloons, you got some eye holes. All right. So basically, when you ventilate through here, air comes out this way and in theory, you ventilate the trachea, all right? In theory, you do not ventilate the esophagus. Sometimes, occasionally, if you're using a king that's appropriate or smaller size, this thing will go into the trachea, all right? That really doesn't do a lot of good, all right? And sometimes these things are placed too deep, all right? And these eye holes are too low. If you place this too high, the eye hole's in the wrong place, all right? These things should always be checked with the, uh, syringe and air to make sure the balloons work. If this balloon doesn't inflate, that's not going to stay in the appropriate place. It's going to move up and down. And you're not going to ventilate your patient. These kings also have a gastric outlet channel. You put a small OG tube, very small, that goes down, comes out the end, and you can decompress the belly as well. These come in all sizes down to little bitty peds. All right. The way these work, you slide them into the hilt to the rim is at the level of the teeth. You inflate the balloon. As you inflate it, it should rise up to the appropriate location. You can check placement like you do an ET tube, capnography. Um, if you're doing this, you got to have waveform capnography. All right. If you're just a BLS transport and have EMTs only, you need at least the easy cap, the uh, litmus paper check. You should get gas exchange. That should show up. There we go. Quick video. There are not many videos out there that show uh, blind insertion of a king. The ones that I can find all have them using the laryngoscope and then the OR. 
Remember, the OR is a little bit different than we are. Patients are NPO past midnight. Our patients usually have already have secretions of vomitus in the mouth. Got to check the balloon, make sure they work. You can use a little lubricant. In reality, what I usually do is I'm kind of dipping in the patient's mouth. There's secretions of vomit that lubricates it there. This is by no means a sterile procedure. All right, you go in the back of the throat toward the esophagus. It is not sterile. So the patient should have been ventilated already with an OPA. If you wanted to place an NG tube before then, that's fine. That kind of goes in from the side. It goes all the way down. And a real patient should go down almost to the red cap, hits the teeth. Okay, obviously if it meets resistance, you don't force it, but it should slide in pretty easy. As you inflate the balloons, the tube should rise up and you know you're in the correct position. Mistake here is put capnography on, right? So waveform capnography in the world of COVID. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, put a viral filter over that as well. The next thing I'll do in the world of COVID we live in is I'm going to take a towel or a chucks pad or something and kind of wrap around the patient's face so that if we're doing CPR, we're still not blowing up particles that way. Now, obviously, if you're in the public's eye, you don't want to put a towel or something over somebody's face. It's not seems uh, that doesn't go over very well. But the goal is to limit secretions exposure for you guys. And obviously, in the world of COVID, if you're doing this, you need eye protection. You need an N95. You need gloves, like always, and some sort of um, gown or protective clothing. If you don't have a gown on, if you don't have time for that, when you finish up a patient care, you go back to the base, take those clothes off, wash off, and change clothes. Was there a question, Chief, or am I just hearing things? Yes, we did have a question come in. So what's your thoughts about the studies uh, showing decreased blood flow with blind insertion airway devices? Yes, so I'm not a big fan of the King because of that. Um, you inflate this big balloon, the, you got the carotids that run through here. So if you have somebody in a low flow state already, cardiac arrest, you're doing chest compressions, you're trying to move blood up and out of the brain, when you inflate this, common sense kind of tells me you probably decrease some blood supply as well. So I'm not a big fan of the key. Um, there, a lot of folks still are. There's no hard evidence that says they should not do that. Um, but if I have the choice between a blind insertion device that has a balloon and one that does not, I'm going with the one that does not. So. These are approved for use by the FDA and by our state. So if you want to do them and your offline medical director is fine with that, that's cool. But uh, I'm not a big fan of the Kings. What I do like is I like these eye gels. Um, this is a uh, um, device that has no balloon. So if you look at the parts to it, you got this kind of soft plastic rubbery material. You got a bite block here. You got a gastric channel that runs from here all the way down to the end of the eye gel. So you can place an OG tube, a small one through there, and you got a bite block. The way this works is basically you pull a chin back, chin comes back, no fingers go in the mouth, and this gently slides behind the tongue through the hypopharynx and should just sit right there at the glottic opening. Pretty easy to use and you get a pretty good seal. This material here that goes over the glottic opening, as it gets warm, kind of stick, gets sticky, and will kind of attach itself to that glottic opening. So you get almost like a uh, tracheal intubation. Key phrase there is almost, right? Uh, so this one's pretty easy to use. I used, um, last week I put two in uh, in the ER uh, during cardiac arrest. I think you get great ventilation with these devices. By that I mean, as you breathe for the patient and they exhale, you get great return of CO2. So you get great capnography if the patient's alive. All right. And you get decent sense as well. Now, remember, any of these blind devices, as you ventilate and squeeze the bag and air goes in, it's going to push against the soft tissue and kind of back away some. So that's why this being sticky kind of helps a little bit. So you get great ventilation, pretty good oxygenation with this. Um, I, I like the IG. I think it works pretty reasonable. You can always put an OG tube in around it, a big OG tube. If you're going to do that, obviously you want to do that first because once this is placed, it's tough to get that OG tube to go around this. Okay. 
you can also get a bigger OG tube in than this port is made for. So these ports, I think about a 10 size 10 OG tube is the biggest you're gonna get. That's a little bitty. Okay, I can put a big one, a 16 or 18 in orally before that and it works pretty good. All right. One thing I didn't mention earlier, we're talking about OG tubes. If you can place one, the way you measure for that is you measure the tube from the ear to the nose to the xiphoid process. And then you mark that with a marker or a piece of tape so you know how far you want to get to get in the stomach. Okay. Hey, Doc, what's your thoughts on eye gel? I know this is a loaded question versus uh, intubation. And so laryngeospasm is one issue that the eye gel can't overcome. Correct. The intubation can't overcome. Correct. Anything else, or do you see this really starting to take the place of intubation as we move forward? So uh, I've always been a proponent of intubating people in cardiac arrest. Um, even though I know that some of the 2000 studies talked about there were some bad outcomes. Um, I think there's, how can I say this correctly? There's, a, I think there's some flaws in those studies. And I also think the common sense thing is if you have a patient in cardiac arrest that gets ROS and they get to the hospital, we don't keep an eye gel or a King or a combi tube in them, they get intubated. The benefits of any kind of advanced airway or you improve oxygenation by giving positive pressure, you prevent them from aspirating, you provide PEEP, you recruit lung uh, air sacs, all right? That's the benefit, right? The downside of any advanced airway is you increase intrathoracic pressure, which decreases blood return to the heart, which lowers blood pressure, which can decrease blood supply to the heart, to the brain, everything else, right? So, Correct. Whether you're doing an AMBU bag and a, and a bag, bag, bag valve mask, whether you have an eye gel or a, a King airway. So that being said, I think that if you can intubate someone readily, you get all the benefits of an advanced airway and you get better benefits than you do with the blind insertion airway. And it's just as dangerous as the other two. So I think intubation is a good thing. I don't think I expressed that the way I wanted it to, but the short is early intubation and cardiac arrest, I think, is very prudent. Now, that doesn't mean we stop CPR. That doesn't mean we spend 15 minutes looking for an airway. That means we get an airway as we're doing everything else. And with video scopes today, that's fairly easy. You can intubate during cardiac arrest, during CPR with a video scope, get it first pass. Then you have a secure airway. You're given the optimal oxygenation and ventilation, and you got a better chance for a good outcome. The other thing you got to remember is that out of hospital cardiac arrest, they're all lumped together. So the guy that goes into VTAC VFib from a STEMI is lumped in with the guy who has hyperkalemia and goes into cardiac arrest, is lumped into the person who has bad COPD and goes into cardiac arrest for respiratory failure. So early intubation of somebody for respiratory distress is paramount. Nothing else is going to work, right? So hope that answered your question reasonably. So this is a video of an eye gel. And again, these are very easy to do. No fingers go in the mouth, pull the jaw. That can be prelude with some KY, or you can just kind of dip it in their mouth and it secretions and it slides in. See how it kind of stopped for a second in the hypopharynx? Then you got complete placement. Very easy to do. You got a bite block, so if this is during CPR, <clears throat> and they get it rosk and they start chewing, it's not going to chew through the tube. You can watch the chest rise and fall. And then obviously you got waveform capnography to confirm placement. So eye gels are very easy to place. The only big drawback I see to these is sometimes you occasionally have someone get excited and when they move the chin back. They put the eye gel in, it catches the tongue and it pushes the tongue back and it won't go. It's sort of like when you do an OPA and you're too aggressive. As long as you don't do that, you're fine. But there's limited risk and good benefits for eye gels. There's really no measurement. So it's a size, it's uh, weight based, um, and they come in different colors. So you just kind of guesstimate their weight and pick the one that you want. The normal adult works for most people 60 to 90 kilograms. I think it's yellow is the color of it. I'd have to, I can't remember. Uh, there was a British person 
talking over the last video I showed, so that's why the Geico guy's there. So, he's pretty cool. So capnography is uh, an added to the EMT scope of practice as well. So again, there's no way this lecture is going to give you detailed use of how capnography works. Um, for the paramedics that do nasal capnography, they can use capnography to differentiate COPD, asthma versus heart failure versus other issues. That's no way we can address that today. What I do want to stress is how this kind of works. Capnography measures how much carbon dioxide is exhaled. All right. To get gas exchange, you got to have, if this is the blood vessels, these are your air sacs. And that's the bronchioles going out to the trachea, right? So you got to have blood supply coming from the heart. So you got to have heart movement or CPR. There's got to be live tissues out there. So you got to have gas exchange, metabolism, and that CO2 has to go into the air sacs and be exchanged, right? So when the patient exhales, you get the CO2 coming out. So this will give you a ventilation rate as you're looking at your machine. So you, blast, you pass a blind insertion device, you hook them up to waveform capnography, you start ventilating, you look over, SATs should increase. You should see a waveform like this, and this tells you how much the CO2 is. So now I confirm placement that my eye gel was working appropriately, all right? The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going through doing CPR with this patient. If I see a big spike in capnography, so if this goes from this height to now this height, and I was running in the 20s and now I'm 60, that tells me something changed. We got more CO2 coming out. That's because we got ROSC. So we got more blood supply. We got more live tissue, more gas exchange blowing off that acid, that CO2, and you'll see this. So now I can reach around and get a pulse and next pulse check, take them off, look and see. You should have good perfusion at that point. All right. There are a couple of good videos on the BRIMS webpage. Uh, you can download and watch to talk about capnography. And again, I would start there and then move forward. Any questions, you need to reach out to your offline medical director. Sensor. Yes, sir. Cats can, do oh, cats can do anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. All right, so BiPAP has been added to the EMT level scope of practice. We had CPAP added, I wanna say about four years ago. So, added for CHF, there's some safety issues we're going to talk about. And then we'll talk about a few other places besides CHF you can use it. So, if you look at our protocols, it talks about we now have CPAP or BiPAP. The problem with BiPAP is that you have to have a ventilator to run that for the most part. So, if you're doing uh, an agency that does a lot of interfacility transports, you may have a ventilator. If you run an ALS non-transport, you may not. You may have old school ventilator, which is an AMBU bag, right? So basically what CPAP and BiPAP is, is positive pressure. So CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure, all right? BiPAP is bi-level, so we get one number. So I may set it at five centimeters of pressure, and that means I put the mask on the patient. We got five centimeters of water pressure pushing air into the lungs, okay? And that does a couple things. That improves recruitment of the air sacs, so we get increased oxygenation, all right? So it's really good for people who are hypoxic, that's CPAP. Now, the problems with this is that when I increase the pressure into lungs, I decrease the blood pressure, right? I increase the pressure into lungs, it makes this pressure higher, and all blood supply back to the heart is a low flow, right? It's venous. There's no muscles to pump it in there. So if I increase this pressure, I decrease blood return to the heart. So you get some hypotension. Obviously with CPAP, you can't put a mask on somebody who's vomiting or altered because if they ever start to vomit, we're gonna be forcing that vomit into the air sacs, causing aspiration, making it worse to oxygenate and ventilate them. So that's pretty bad. BiPAP is nice because it gives you two levels. So instead of just having one number, now I can change it. So every time the patient breathes in, they get 10 or 12 or 15 centimeters of pressure. And when they exhale, we drop it back down to five. So now I can help them get air in. And then when they exhale, I keep a little bit of pressure so they don't collapse all these air sacs. So pretty useful thing, all right? BiPAP is better than CPAP. Some people don't tolerate BiPAP well. They can't get the rhythm of it. 
Um, and then the other problems with BiPAP is you got to have a ventilator. When I have someone who has congestive heart failure, a patient has a uh, history of renal disease, they missed dialysis, and the blood pressure is 240 over 120. Their SATs are like 84%, they're breathing 32 times a minute, their diaphragm look like dirt. There's a mnemonic I think of to manage this. And I, I like the ABC mnemonic. The other one I like is LMNOP. And that stands for Lasix, Morphine, Nitro, Oxygen, and then Position. And I work it backwards. So if I'm on scene with a guy in a dialysis chair that showed up four days missing dialysis, who is diaphoretic, breathing hard, unstable, looks ill, when I get there, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit him straight up, right? If I sit him straight up, I'm able to get oxygen to at least part of the lungs. Even if there's fluid all in here, if I sit him up, I may get a little bit of oxygenation and ventilation. If I lay him flat, this is gonna layer out and he's become more distressed. It's called orthopnea, uh, but these guys can go into cardiac respiratory arrest pretty significant uh, if you lay him flat. So position, all right? And the next thing I'm gonna do is do pressure. So if I got CPAP, I'm gonna put them on CPAP. If I have BiPAP, I'm gonna put them on BiPAP. It's gonna do two things. It's gonna lower his blood pressure right out of the way. All right? And that's gonna make it easier for the fluid that's in the lungs to be pumped out by the heart if I lower that systemic pressure. It also decreases preload. So it brings less blood into the heart that gets stuck in the lungs. So CPAP, BiPAP saves lives. Very good for these folks, all right? Obviously, I'm going to put them on oxygen while I do this. I'm going to stick at 100%. I don't care if they have COPD or not. They're hypoxic. They're in distress. They get as much O2 as I can for the first few minutes until they get more stable. If they quit breathing, we ventilate them. Blind insertion device, OPA, BBM, intubate them if you're a paramedic. All right. Nitro is the end. Nitro decreases preload and lowers blood pressure. Works like the BiPAP. I can do all three of these things without putting an IV in them, all right? If it's a dialysis patient, it might take a few minutes to get IV access. This is quick and simple. Now, if their blood pressure was low, I can't do all that, right? But a 240 over 120, yeah, I'm gonna sit them up, pop a nitro under the tongue, put them on BiPAP or CPAP, high flow O2, all right? Once that done is done, then I'm working on IV access, getting the glucose, my partner's putting a 12 lead, all right, and we're thinking about what we're gonna do. Are we gonna stay here for a few minutes and let the ventilations get better before we move out, all right? Morphine is a dirty narcotic. Uh, it's used a lot of times in cardiac problems, respiratory problems. It makes people go from I don't feel good to I don't feel good, but I don't care, right? But morphine also releases histamine when you give it. Histamine causes vasodilation, lowers blood pressure. So it kind of helps a little bit too, useful. Lasix is a diuretic. So most people who have pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema, uh, have volume overload in their lungs. The rest of the volume in the body really doesn't matter. So you can give Lasix to people with flash pulmonary edema. It takes a while to work. And usually you get the fluid off other parts of the body before you do the lungs. So it's not a big deal uh, in the pre-hospital or even the ER setting, in my opinion. Obviously by core measures in the hospital, we can give these folks Lasix. Uh, but for the emergency management for these people, I'm not going to do that uh, for the most part. If they have kidney disease, end-stage renal disease on dialysis, I'm not going to give them Lasix anyway because they're not going to make a lot of urine. So that is CPAP or BiPAP. Any questions online within reason? Don't be shy. One thing I want to clarify, something I think is important, just want to hear what your thoughts are. For uh, severe acute congestive heart failure patients, really anybody with pulmonary edema who's hypertensive, yes, fluid overload, um, I think it's really important to start getting them stabilized before you move them. Yes. Uh, just because it seems like they they tend to go into cardiac arrest once you move them. Right. And I'm not sure what all the reasons for that are, but I'm assuming yeah. more strain on the heart, yeah. hand, feet hanging low, and uh, then you prop them up on the stretcher and it changes that pressure dynamic. Right. I don't know, just thoughts on that because I know these these patients are really sick and we have a tendency to really want to get out of there fast because right. they're so sick. Right. You're, you're better off spending extra time on the scene managing the underlying problem. So if this patient, these vitals, the situation, you get on scene, you're like, okay, they look like dirt. We got to go to the hospital now. 
if you put them on a couple liters of O2 or even a non-rebreather and you start moving them and it takes you 12, 15 minutes to get them out to the truck, that's another 15 minutes of hypoxia and problems, okay? It's also then moving around, which increases cardiac workload and makes it harder to get that fluid out. So I agree. This patient, I'm going to sit them up, pop nitros under the tongue, CPAP or BiPAP, all right? Start working on the IV, looking at a 12 lead to make sure they're not hyperkalemic because they're dialysis, all right? And I'm going to give a few minutes to stabilize. If they get more stable, then we can start moving to the truck. If they don't get better in the next few minutes, you're going to have to be more aggressive, right? Which is probably intubation or something else. So I'm like you. These medical type patients, stay there, get them stable. Now, if you look at the 12 lead, and the 12 lead is a big freaking STEMI, that changes everything because now time matters, right? But otherwise, you're better off stabilizing the patient on scene before moving them. What if this guy weighed 400 pounds? There's no way you're going to move this guy easily, right? So sit there, stabilize him. If you need to with this CPAP or BiPAP, put a nasal trumpet in and then put the BiPAP over that. That'll give you a great airway as well. But I agree, stabilize them on scene before you start moving them. Remember in the world of COVID, CPAP, BiPAP, high flow O2 can generate some droplets. Make sure you're wearing N95 goggles like we talked about for intubation. There's a risk for that. Other things you can talk about, so we talked about CHF and renal disease, fluid volume overload. People who have COPD and have bronchial constriction retain CO2. CPAP and BiPAP will open up those airways and let them exhale that CO2 better. So if I got a guy that's, you know, 60 kilos, been smoking since 1952, breathing 40 times a minute, who's hypoxic, looks like dirt, history of COPD, I'm going to hit them with high flow O2, NEB treatments, IV access, I'm going to be considering magnesium for those guys, all right? And then if I want to do some CPAP or BiPAP, that again is going to open up those airways and make them breathe better. So very useful stuff. Remember, contraindications to CPAP or BiPAP, altered mental status, low blood pressure, or folks who have COPD have restricted lung disease. Sometimes they have blebs, little out pockets in the lungs that can pop, and they get pneumothorax. So if you have a concern for a pneumothorax, you don't do positive pressure ventilation either. Well, yeah, yes, if they're not breathing, duh. Thanks, Chief. So uh, a new I.O. site has been approved by the state uh, for um, advanced EMTs and paramedics. You can use a distal femur for kids. This is really good. It's a bigger bone to hit. You basically want to go a couple of finger breaths above the patella and go medial, and you drill that in. You can firm placement the same way. First thing you do is once you drill in, it should be firm and not move. You want to try to aspirate bone marrow. If you do, great. If you don't, you can still be okay. Flush it with about 10 cc's of saline. If the soft tissue doesn't swell and it goes in, you're in the right place. Any medication you can give IV, you can give IO. All right. I do not recommend putting Curlex or Cling around these things. You want to leave them open so you can look to see if they start swelling on the back side of that leg. All right. If you have to tape it down or secure this with Curlex or Coban or Ace Wrap, it's not in the bone. It should stay there pretty readily. Okay. This is approved for ages two and under. And you got to make sure the device that you're using is FDA approved. The only one that I found so far that's FDA approved, the distal femur, uh, is the easy IO. Hey, Doc, what, do you happen to know what size needle? Because easy IO is three size needles. It's the yeah. pink, the blue, and the yellow. Yellow is the 45 millimeter that we use on the shoulder. Yeah. Blue is 25 millimeters. I, I, I do not know the numbers. So, uh, the way I do this is I look at the needle. So the red one, I think, is a very small one, right? It's the smallest one, I think. The pink, red, pink, whatever. Um, so you can use even the yellow, the long needle that's made for really big shoulders and big people. You can use that on a kid if you measure. So that needle is long. It has hash marks on it. You can measure that. So if you're not sure, if you, only, if you have a limited budget and can only buy one, I would buy the easy IO drill and that one long needle and keep that. And what you can do is when you get to this kid, you pull that needle out, you look at it, you put it next to the kid, and you kind of measure, and you figure out how deep you want to go. 
then obviously as you drill, when you meet resistance, once you meet resi that resistance and you feel that like give, you're in the right place. OK, so you can use the adult size needle on kids if you measure appropriately and then you confirm placement. All right. So that being said, week of September 4th, I think that's a Thursday, Friday, third and fourth, maybe I'm doing cadaver lab. So those in the Brims region that should be posted soon. You can sign up for that. If you have not done IOs on real people, you need to come to this. We're going to do chest decompression as well. Um, and again, you don't want to be doing IOs on anybody unless you've been trained, checked off by your training officer and your offline medical director. OK. Contraindications would be obviously a fracture in that bone. If the bone is cracked, if you put fluid in it, <clears throat> that fluid will come right back out and not get in central circulation. And this is again only for kids and only if the device you use is approved by the FDA to do it there. By ads in the past, obviously still in our state, uh, intubation kids is category B. I mean, you got a call. Uh, you can place a blind insertion device on kids if they need it. Don't have to call anybody, and that makes sense. So if you got to show up on scene, you got a five-year-old post-drowning that is in respiratory distress, unresponsive. You can slide a King or an eye gel and ventilate them, stabilize them before you start calling that control. You should be able to do that. Okay, but again. You got to practice these things, OK? You can't just watch this video, listen to me, and think you got it down. You need to get out the equipment, practice with the plastic on the mannequins, and then hopefully get out and have some training real time as well. We added the state, the state added uh, hemodialysis uh, emergency disconnect. There are a lot of folks doing home hemodialysis now, not just peritoneal dialysis. And they can have issues. So this is several pages in our protocols you can look at. When you get up on scene, they should have a small device. Someone should take a quick picture of this with your cell phone, so we'll have access to what the readings were. OK, if the patient is awake and alert and disconnect themselves, they can do that. If they're altered, confused, something else and they can't, take a quick picture of this. There should be an on off switch. Click it off. And then what you want to do is you don't really want to disconnect the IV from the graft on the patient. All right, there's a risk you could damage that because those needles are pretty big and you're not used to doing that. All right, the way we access these people for dialysis are two ways. We make a fistula where we go in surgically and attach a vein to an artery. It takes about three months for that to heal. You get a big freaking vessel. And then for dialysis, we access that with two needles so we can put fluid in and get blood out and clean that out. The other option is we put a piece of plastic tubing from one vein, wrap it around, hook it to an artery. Those heal faster and we can use those. Obviously there's a risk for breakage, infection, there are some risks for that. But that's the most common things you're gonna see. So they'll come in, you'll have two IV, two needles, sometimes one, but usually just two needles in there. So if the patient is hooked up, what you wanna do is come back out here. You wanna clamp off this tubing put a cap on here. Sometimes they have caps at bedside and not. You can put like a the end of a HEP lock or saline lock on these. You can put a 10 cc syringe, screw those on there and then tape all this down. All right. If this comes loose, you're going to see pretty significant bleeding. You want to put direct pressure on that till the bleeding stops. All right. You don't want to do like a real bad pressure dressing. You don't want to do a lot of damage to this, but if it's bleeding, you got to do direct pressure till it stops. Okay. If for some reason this thing has ruptured, torn, and there's a pulsatile flow coming out of that, you got to stop that. You can imagine the quick blood loss with this. If these things rupture, people can die in a matter of minutes. Not always, not the most common thing, but it does happen. So that would mean if this is squirting blood, one hand goes on, stops pressure, and you put a tourniquet proximal on that. Okay. Do not put a tourniquet on them and this is bleeding. All right. You increase the pressure in these vessels up here, you can damage this. And that means I got to get a new access graft and that's bad. But if it's bleeding, if it's pumping blood, they're bleeding out. You got to control that bleeding. Remember, folks who get dialysis, they get loaded with blood thinners before they do this. so This blood doesn't clot off. So every dialysis they get, they get a whole bunch of heparin. So they're very prone to having bleeding disorders. Just different pictures.
All right, this is the one that's caused some confusion, but in short, they just, we've added, a de the state has added a different location for needle decompression, okay? So when you think about needle decompression, we only do that for attention pneumothorax. Regular pneumothoraxes don't need it in the field, but attention does, all right? So a pneumothorax is when you have some kind of tear into lung tissue so that when they breathe in, whoa, that wasn't good. So when they breathe in, air goes into the lungs and into that potential space between the visceral and parotid pleura that y'all learned in school, all right? So signs of a closed pneumothorax will be indications they have some kind of injury, right? Baseball bat to the chest, they got crepitus, they got bruising, tender to the chest, they may have diminished breath sounds, they may have low sats, all right? So those folks get treated with high flow O2, quick trauma assessment and transport to the hospital. And this can be closed or open. They could also get stabbed and cause the same problem, right? Attention pneumothorax is where they have a pneumothorax, which can cause chest pain, shortness of breath, decreased sats, increased work of breathing, all right? Plus, there's so much air into lungs now that this lung is compressed and pushes all these big vessels over. And remember we talked about the blood supply to the heart, the vena, through the vena cava is low flow. You increase this pressure, you stop blood supply to the heart. So now they have pneumothorax and signs of tension. And that's defined as tension would be altered mental status and low cardiac output. So altered mental status and low blood pressure. Altered mental status and no blood pressure. So it could be cardiac arrest. That'll be signs of attention pneumothorax. Somebody with a pneumothorax, decompensates in the back of the truck, goes into cardiac arrest, he's probably got attention pneumothorax. He needs a chest decompression. Or it's a guy who's got a pneumothorax that you pick up clinically, all right, and now he's more hypoxic. You got a carotid pulse that's weak, but you can't get a good blood pressure, and he's confused, all right? So I define tension as cardiac arrest or ultramental status and low blood pressure, all right? The location, I don't know why that YouTube thing popped up there. The location uh, for chest decompression, we always been talking about third intercostal space, second or third midclavicular line, all right? So the, what I do is I find the sternal notch, I kind of follow the clavicle up, and I realize that the first rib is somewhere around that first clavicle. I feel one rib process down, and then I go above the next rib. I try to go above the rib, not below, because below the ribs, you got nerves and artery and veins. Some people, it's hard to tell. So if I slide that needle in and I hit bone, I try to angle it up and not angle it down, all right? You don't want to go in what we call the box. You want to stay away from the sternum, the way from midline. You got big vessels there, very bad, all right? The new place the state is approved is in the fourth or fifth intercostal space, mid-axillary. So this patient is looking up. This is their sternal notch. That's their head, all right? We think about the anatomical nipple line is about the fifth or sixth space. And remember, the diaphragm comes way up here. So you can have abdominal issues up here on exhalation. So you never wanna go below the anatomical nipple line, okay? Now, some people have more breast tissue and the nipple line may be moved around, but you wanna stay above the anatomical nipple line is what you wanna do, all right? If you think about the axilla, this is his armpit right through here. There's a triangle of safety, we kind of call it. And this is the area that we want to stay at. And that's where we put our chest tubes. So you can do fourth or fifth intercostal space, mid axillary line, that's reasonable. Um, remember, you got to have a needle that's at least probably three and a half inches. You got some folks that are really big and it's tough to do that. I still like the anterior approach uh, because if I got somebody laying on their back, on my stretcher, and they have a tension pneumothorax, that air is going to float up and it's going to be easy to access and less risk of hitting the lung. Okay. Lateral side is approved by the state. Practice on the mannequins. Cadaver lab will do it there. Um, but again, you need to get trained on this before you start doing it. Okay. Big risk on the lateral side. If you go too low, you're going to go under the diaphragm, hit bowel, stomach, or spleen. That's poor form. Okay.
<clears throat> so this is a quick video. I did show this one last time as well. It's pretty good. It's the view from inside the chest. Somebody had a scope in there recording. And the guy had a big Nemo and they showed what it looked like putting the needle in there. So this is looking into the chest. Those are ribs. That's the needle. So needle goes in. Needle slides out. Plastic catheter stays in. This is the lung. So that lung was completely compressed because there was air in there. We're taking the air out. The lung now fills up that chest cavity. So with a real pneumothorax, a tension pneumothorax, when you put that needle and catheter in there, you're probably not going to hit lung tissue because air is there, right? If when you put the needle in, once you feel that slide through, almost like when you feel the needle go in with an IV, once you feel that give, you quit advancing the needle and you slide the catheter in. All right, and there's less risk for damage in the lung. Well, that's pretty cool. Shows you the big difference, right? Excellent. Hey, Doc, is there usually um, bleeding when the does the does the parietal pleural rip away? No. Yeah, so that is really hard to see. In cadaver lab, we can show you. It's I, I think of it as you know biological saran wrap. That stuff is really hard to peel away and move. Okay, it's supposed to be a thin layer that allows uh, kind of a, a lubrication so that lung can expand and contract. So it's hard to see. You will get some bleeding just because you're going through tissue. Sometimes there's a, a, a vein or something or a small artery that you poke and you get some bleeding. Sometimes you hit the lung tissue, and you get some bleeding as well. But obviously, if the person is in cardiac arrest, the risk to benefit. There's a lot of benefit and no risk. If they think they have a pneumothorax with signs of tension, ultramental status, hemodynamically insta instable, the risk is limited because we can actually save a life for that. So anybody, GSW to the chest, GSW to the belly comes in, cardiac arrest, they go down right there. We're going to needle each side of the chest real quick as we're getting airway and starting blood because this, if it's a tension pneumothorax, you will save their life. If it's not, you probably won't, but it hasn't hurt them. Does that make sense? Sort of, kind of? Okay, one more little video. I hope. So this one I kind of like just because it shows a technique. Again, the way to do this is y'all need to come to the lab. Do you have a way to advance the video, Chief? Or is that just going to be me? No, I just want to kind of go a little bit further so we miss some of the junk. So this is one of the ones on the market out there. And I, again, I don't care what you got. It's just got to be big enough to work and long enough. So at least about three inches, three and a quarter. You want a big, if you use an IV catheter, at least a 14. A lot of devices out there on the market you can buy as well. But location, sternal notch, find the clavicle. You know, the first rib is somewhere under there. So you can go down two rib spaces, or I just try to find the third rib. I, I clean if I have time. And then I'm gonna aim for that rib. I'm gonna hit the rib with a needle and then advance forward, advance it up. So he's in the skin, kind of hits the rib, it's gonna adjust. Then he's gonna push and you'll see it kind of give, boom, at that point, you don't have to go any further. Don't push the needle in anymore. Hold it, slide that catheter in like you would an IV, and that should slide nice and easy, okay? And you're done. Needle's out, keep on trucking down the road. If they get better, yay. If they don't, consider doing the other side of the chest as well, right? If there are concerns for pneumothorax over there. This is a little one-way valve this company makes. You really don't need it. Um, we know we used to cut the, the finger off your glove. You put that on that flutter valve. People buy devices like a Heimlich valve and put on there. In reality, you don't have to do that. You're not going to get enough air sucked back in to make a reoccurrence of a tension pneumo. The goal here is get enough air out, relieve pressure, improve blood supply, and keep them alive. Again, come to the cadaver lab. We can show that stuff. It makes a lot more sense when you see it on a real person. All right.
Uh, updates, we do now have a statewide tactical paramedic protocol. In short, uh, if you have the patch, if you have the training and get the certificate, everything is category A uh, as you're working in the uh, tactical environment and you can add a surgical airway. This does not mean that you can do a surgical airway if you have no training. You got to train that stuff. So if you're gonna be doing surgical crikes, okay, if you're gonna be practicing under the category A, everything is no call. You better have an offline medical director that's involved and you better be able to do these surgical crikes and you need to train for this, okay? Yes, they're fairly easy to do, but the decision to do them is complicated, all right? And you gotta have some training, so. You gotta have a medical director for help with that. So things removed, the chest decompression form is now gone. Nothing to fill out. And remember for tension pneumothorax, you gotta have a pneumothorax and then signs of tension, then it's category A, right? What about a uh, person, cardiac arrest? You do CPR for 10 minutes. You finally get ROSC. You get them intubated. They're looking great. You head into the hospital and now they drop their SATs. They're hard to ventilate. And they go back in cardiac arrest again. Think about tension pneumothorax, right? You did CPR on this patient. You're cracking ribs, right? And you got positive pressure. They're high risk for pneumothorax. So now they are at risk for pneumothorax and you have signs of tension, which is read cardiac arrest. Now, if they go into V-fib, that's different, right? You shock that. But if they, respiratory problems, hard to bag, drop sats, drop the blood pressure, and then arrest again, or just drop their blood pressure, think about decompressing that chest, okay? DNR form's gone, and we move the critical care section to a different thing. Other updates, TXA, so TXA, um, was category B and it was one gram and there were some kind of vague indications for it, made it easy. If you have an adult that has hemorrhagic shock, trauma, and signs of hemodynamic instability and you think they're bleeding out, they get two grams of TXA, it says over 20 minutes. Now a lot of this stuff comes in one gram per 100 cc's, pre-mixed. If that's all you got, that's fine. That doesn't mean don't give anything give the gram, all right? You wanna give it about 100 milligrams a minute or you can get some hypotension. So hang this, all right? There are limited risks to this drug. One thing you do have to do is when you get to the hospital, let them know you gave TXA. This screws up some lab tests that we do in the hospital, so we need to know this. But limited risk, a lot of benefit. TXA, basically what it does is when you get a clot in your body, your body has red cells and then all these strands that hold clots together. The body says every few minutes, send cells back to this clot, says, do I still need this clot or not? I'm going to start breaking this clot down and using this material somewhere else until the body sees it starts bleeding again. Then it brings that material back. What TXA does is tells these cells in short, hey, leave this clot alone. We don't want to break it up. So it keeps your body from breaking down clots. So it helps uh, prevent more blood loss. Obviously, blood products are the best thing in the pre-hospital environment. That's hard to get, especially in today's world with COVID and there being a shortage of blood. You can carry blood products and administer if you're advanced practice or critical care paramedics in the state of Alabama. That's the way to go. That's tough to get these days. TXA can save lives. TXA is useful for other things. We'll go into that in another EMS challenge, but it can be used for angioedema, for uh, uh, bleeding from dialysis grafts, things like that, nosebleeds. But category A stuff, what we're gonna be mostly using in the in pre-hospital world is hemorrhagic shock. And then we change the dose of atropine. Hey, yes, sir. Hey, before you get on to that, Doug, we did have a question online. Sure. Uh, any idea on where to get tactical metal uh, medic training? So there are numerous classes out there. I can't think of the names of them. They got all these abbreviations. There's two or three good courses out there. To get approved by the state, you have to get the patch, the same organization that does critical care paramedics does tactical paramedics. So yeah, I, I suspect that we're gonna see more of these classes coming up because the state requires it now. And so it's not only get your offline medical director to approve 
and your agency to, to approve right before you went to the expanded scope or right. did something so like that. So, like so my, way. yeah, yeah. So basically, if you're doing tactical support and you're not going to be doing category A stuff, you're not going to use the tactical paramedic protocols, nothing has changed. If you want to go category A with tactical support and have surgical airways, you got to have the patch. You got to pass the test by that stand by the national organization. All right. And you're going to common sense says you're going to have to have a medical director that is active with you and you're going to have to train on surgical airways. That's not something you watch a video, take a test and you go do. You got to have actual training for that or you're going to kill somebody. Ketamine, ketamine came out in 2018. I still want to touch it. We still got some issues with ketamine. Ketamine is used for pain management or for altered mental status. And I know I talked about this last time, but I'll mention again, it's really not altered mental status. It's, it's this excited delirium. Excited delirium is basically a term that we use for people who are super out of it, usually combative, confused. It's the 40 year old guy that's butt naked running down the street that you're dispatched to help the police with, okay? It's not the 84 year old lady with a UTI who's kind of clawing at scratching at people talking to herself. Excited delirium is people who are usually super strong, altered and combative. Lots of things can cause it, acute psychosis, the schizophrenia, office medicine, the guy who's bipolar and now acutely psychotic. Alcohol can cause this. Alcohol withdrawal can cause it as well. Obviously, hypoglycemia can make people get kind of act weird, get have seizures, get combative. That's self-limiting. After a few minutes, they pass out. You can recognize that with a good AccuCheck. A lot of drugs out there, coke, spice, meth, a lot of stuff we don't even know what are, they are. People making their own crap these days. There's something called PRESS, which is uh, potentially reversible encephalopathic syndrome. In short, what happens there is you have a blood-brain barrier that keeps a lot of proteins and chemicals out of the brain. If you get super hypertensive, that membrane stretches, so normal proteins in the blood can get into the brain and make you confused and altered. Same thing like with uremia, and then sepsis can cause that, and people get encephalopathic. Usually, these people are not combative and confused. They're just altered, all right? I would say that when we're talking about ketamine use, we're talking about using it for people who are altered, combative, aggressive behavior. All right. With excited delirium, you get increased catecholamines, increased normal body secretion of epi. They get tachycardic, they get hypertensive. If you try to restrain them, they usually get worse. It can also lead to respiratory compromise, especially in certain positions. When you tased, get tased, you increase your blood pressure and heart rate, makes things worse, spreads this membrane, may add to the problem. All right. You can get dysrhythmias, cardiac arrest, a lot of issues with excited delirium. The American College of Physicians said it's better to sedate people than to restrain people. I kind of agree with that. As long as once we sedate them, we manage their airway. If we sedate them and don't manage their airway, we theoretically have killed them and we cannot do that. So ketamine is an anesthetic. It's still limited use in some hospitals. There's some places I work in the state that I have to beg pharmacy to get, but it should be in every ambulance, ALS transport, non-transport in the state of Alabama, okay? It slows down glutamate which excites cells, pretty good drug, all right? It also can do some bronchial dilation. Uh, it's great for COPD and asthma, all right? That's not used pre-hospital here, and that's your advanced practice. Uh, but ketamine is a relatively safe, pretty good drug, okay? Some people you hear about the K-hole, all right? The ketamine hole, think about a bad trip. That's somebody who takes the ketamine, and instead of chillaxing and seeing rainbows dancing in the field, they see demons, all right? If Usually this is people that we give sedation to in the hospital. This is usually not somebody that's super aggressive that we sedate pre-hospital for excited delirium. Those guys usually don't go into this, but just so you know what that is. You get some laryngeal spasm with ketamine that's usually easily compensated with a BVM. Every drug you give can make somebody vomit. A little bit of hypertensive, a little tachycardia, not bad. There's some old school uh, thoughts that you couldn't use ketamine on head injuries. Um, but you actually can. There are a lot of studies out of Philadelphia that show that's safe. Uh, PEDS uses it all the time, okay? So dosing for ketamine, all right? It's four mg per kilo IM for excited delirium. That's max dose, all right? One mg per kilogram IV. My thought is if you have an IV in someone, they probably don't have excited delirium because they let you put an IV in them, right? 
All right. And for pain management, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not a big pain management fan for that, but it's okay. Ketamine is based on ideal body weight, which in short means is height based or length based, not weight based. So these two guys get different doses of medicines. This guy gets the same dose, even though he's 100 pounds bigger. All right. So I got a guy that's five foot six. He's 300 pounds, 160 kilos. He's kicking everybody, kicking everybody's butt, been tased. Cops trying to take him down. Four mix per kilo. How much are we going to give him? If we did regular math and didn't know ideal body weight, we'd say four times 160, which would be greater than 400 milligrams. It's about 640 milligrams. That's more than one vial of ketamine. You should never open more than one vial. That's a red flag. That is too much. Ideal body weight, a lot of formulas out there. I like the formula that is 50 or 52 kilograms at five foot and two kilograms per inch over. Okay. And this is just a rough guesstimation. It doesn't have to be exact. All right. But at five foot six, that guy earlier, he'd be 52 plus six times two is 12. He'd be 64 kilograms versus the 130 kilos we said earlier. Big difference in dosage right there. All right. So think about it's almost like length based stuff for adults. Ketamine dosing for you guys to do critical care. Think about how you calculate audio body weight for event settings, tidal volume. Same thing with ketamine. I recommend if you don't want to do that math, things you can do. Know your height, know how much ketamine you would get if you went berserk. That way you can look at your patient and kind of guesstimate what their height is and go on that. All right. Other option you can do is just cut the dose down to maybe two mg per kilo. Good news with ketamine is if you give them four mg per kilo and that dude got 640 milligrams of ketamine, the only thing that's going to happen is he's going to quit breathing. And if you do a good job post ketamine assessment, you're catch that and you'll fix the problem and there's no bad outcome. Problem is, if you don't catch it, dude can die. So post ketamine, these patients are now critical. You expose them, you cut their clothes off, they get cardiac monitor, they get SAT monitor. If you have entitled CO2, they get that, all right? They get a glu glucose check. You roll them, you look for holes, you look for patches, things that kill people, all right? You get an EKG, you look for tachycardia, dysrhythmias, all right? If they become hypoxic, they do not get oxygen off the bat. They get airway management, jaw thrust, nasal trumpet. See if that fixes the problem. If they're still hypoxic, at that point, they get an OPA or a blind insertion device and you ventilate them. All right. If that doesn't fix the problem or they're completely uptunded, you intubate them and you ventilate them and you confirm placement with waveform capnography. OK, you cannot give them just oxygen. What happens is you give them four, six liters of O2, their sats will stay up, even if they're breathing just three or four times a minute. So you got 10, 15, 16 minutes, all right, of them being non hypoxic because of your oxygen, but all that time their CO2 goes up. And then at some point they quit breathing completely, they go into cardiac arrest, and they can die, or worse yet, have an anoxic brain injury and have bad problems. So, Post-ketamine, hypoxia, is treated with airway maneuvers, jaw thrust, nasal trumpet. That doesn't work, OPA, blind assertion device, and ventilations, okay? You got to do that. I cannot say that enough. People will die post-ketamine if we do not do this. All right, that's the protocols. We will uh, come back here in about five minutes and talk about a uh, couple cardiac cases, and I'm going to get to a uh, trauma case as well. If you have questions, put them in the chat box. And yeah, we got a couple questions for you, Doug. Yes, sir. All right, so um, back on TXA and the dialysis shunts, if a shunt ruptures and you're holding direct pressure, can TXA help since these patients are already on blood thinners? So yes and no. So yes, TXA can help. But the problem is if that graft or shunt ruptures, think about it, that's like a big vein. It's like somebody's a water rupture right in front of you. So instead of trying to get TXA in these people, you need direct pressure and a tourniquet proximal, and that's going to fix the problem. Okay. Because if you don't stop all that blood flow to that graft, TXA is not going to allow them to clot anyway, and they're going to die on you. Now, if it's minimal bleeding, sometimes just direct pressure. So I've taken TXA and I've drawn it up and I put it on a four by four and put it on things that bleed scalp lax in the nose, on wounds, and that's a reasonable thing to do. 
Uh, but I think for ease of use in the field, if that graft is leaking, direct pressure. If it's pulsatile, it's a tourniquet. Okay. Or even if it's not pulsatile, but they have obvious signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock, like they've become unresponsive. Yes, right. Like if you're there late and it's just dribbling, yeah. Tourniquet, yeah. 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 And at that point, you can do TXA because they can get out of the access and drill, and that's fine. Yes, sir. Okay. So another question. Uh, would ketamine be appropriate on suicidal patients who are refusing transport and seem alert and oriented? And, and then it says, uh, well, has a correction and are alert and oriented. Yes, but that would not be category A. So ketamine is category A for excited delirium and for pain management. And on that note, pain management dose of ketamine should be ideal body weight as well, not total body weight. So nobody, for the most part, should be getting 25 megs of ketamine for pain, and this is their six foot five, right? Six foot five. Um, but yes, yeah, so any drug that you have access to can be cat B by calling that control. So before magnesium was approved by the state for category A for respiratory problems, Medics who knew it could be used for respiratory problems would call in and get orders from offline med control, online med control. So yes, yeah, so if you got a suicidal patient that you're concerned about their safety and your safety, but he's still not excited delirium, and you're going to have to get him in, he's got to come in. Yeah, call med control, tell them the story. I got a suicidal male who's not going to come with us willingly, but I'm concerned for his safety. I need orders to sedate with some ketamine, and I need orders for restraint. Very reasonable. But again, it goes back after you give that ketamine. Patient is now critical. Once he chillaxes, you expose him, monitor inside capnography, get an ACI check, ex to treat them like you would a trauma patient at that point in the game, okay? Because you don't want to be the guy that loses somebody's airway over ketamine. It's not a good feeling. So we've also got a couple of different people asking for the formula again. So oh, sure. The five, the five foot tall, 50 yeah. kilogram. So this is what I use, and again, this is just a rough estimation. There's a lot of formulas out there. There you go. That was it. So there are a lot of formulas out there for ideal body weight that you can use. You can Google. I can't do some of these math with decimal points in my head when I'm tired. 1.36, all that stuff. So basically, a rough estimate is about 52 kilos at five foot. For adults, 50 for females, that's males, and then two per kilo. So even if you said everything was 52 kilograms plus two per inch over five foot, that's still reasonable. This is not an exact dose kind of thing. It's a ballpark figure, but I can tell you there's a big difference between 64 kilos and 130 kilos, right? Cool. All right, let's take five minutes and we'll come back and do a few cases. And then um, next time we're going to have Dr. Payne will be here and he'll talk about pelvic and extremity trauma and he'll also do some EKG stimulant reviews um, and then we start back our regular with a stimulant review every every uh, month uh, and then different cases. Awesome so yeah we'll take about uh, five minutes or, or seven or eight minutes something like that give everybody a chance to to get up and stretch remember to either click the link for the attendance form in the chat box or you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated return with a link to the attendance form. The password for the attendance form for today's class is uh, BIAD, BIAD or Blind Insertion Airway Device. So BIAD is the password for today's class. And we'll see you back here in just a few minutes.
All right, guys, we'll get started again. So one of the things that uh, American Heart is kind of pushing now in the era of COVID is they're going back to early airway management. Uh, they recommend video scopes. Um, so this is something we've been doing at Centerpoint for a while, which is pit crew CPR resuscitation, early airway management. We're not stopping CPR, but we think that uh, quick intubation along with use of capnography makes a big difference. And it doesn't take long to intubate somebody if you're working as a team, right? So somebody's getting hooked onto the monitor, doing CPR. You can tell with this video, CPR is going and a tube is in. And that's what, less than 12 seconds? So very, very easy to do with training, very easy to do with the video, uh, the rangoscopes. If you don't have video learning scopes where you practice, the time is now, okay? Uh, there's no reason to be doing DL anymore. Using the video scope keeps you out of the patient's face, less risk of exposure. Once they're intubated, I put a towel or a chucks pad across the face, so any secretions that are still there down CPR are not getting on you. Even American Heart's going back to early intubation, and we kind of touched on this earlier today as well. So 12 lead EKGs. The way I look at these, and I say, are they too fast, are they too slow, are they okay-ish? So if they're too fast, I go narrow or wide. If they're too slow, I think three things, either drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. Obviously, other things can cause bradycardia. You pick those things up in your primary exam. The kid that's not breathing and apneic, that's bradycardic, his problem is not this. His problem is hypoxia. You ventilate him. You pick that up on your exam, all right? These things you don't pick up on your exam. And then the last thing I say, if the rate's not too fast or too slow, it's kind of okay-ish, and that's where it gets kind of concerning. STEMI, no STEMI, Pregada, Wellens, long QT, all kind of cool things like that. You gotta have a way to know how to do your rate. I use the box method, 300, 150, 100. After that, my mind wanders, and I don't care for a few boxes, but then when I start having to think how many boxes that is and put my glasses on, I'm concerned about bradycardia, right? Intervals, you gotta know, QRS, you got another QT. This is very important. Long QT can cause syncope. Okay. And the next time they syncopize, so they don't wake up because of torsades, it's called cardiac arrest. So you got another QT intervals. PR interval as well, which is first degree heart block, which doesn't matter, but a wide PR interval and a wide QRS concerning for hyperkalemia. So you got to know how to do that, guys. So I look at this one, rate, too fast, too slow, or okay. Fox method, 300, 150, 170. Don't care, don't care, right? So we're running about 70-ish, all right? Then I'm gonna look injury patterns. Look at one AVL in five and six. Two, three in AVF, I'm looking for ST elevation or depression. V1 through V4, these are your septal leads down in the middle of the heart, septal. And these are your anterior, three and four. All right, the next place I look is I look for ST depression. So elevation is a septal or anterior MI. Depression is a posterior. You do not need a posterior EKG to confirm this. If you got ST depression, T wave inversion, V2, 3, or 4, in two of those, that is a posterior MI, it's a STEMI equivalent. They get put in the system, right? The last place I look is lead AVR. Leads one and AVR should be opposite. It tells you that the the leads are on correctly, all right? But AVR also will tell you uh, if you have uh, a STEMI equivalent. So elevation of lead AVR and depression anywhere else in an injury pattern, inferior or lateral, is concerning for a left main, very proximal STEMI, all right? Just a drawing that shows you kind of why that is. 
This is your circumflex, which can come off the left main, sometimes the right, okay? This is the aorta, where the left coronary comes off. So elevation there means it's very proximal, a lot of tissue damage going on. And then the RCA comes off that as well, and that's why you say T3 and AVF. So first case, this is a uh, young female history of hypertension, was going to urgent care, saying she needed her medications refilled. Uh, <clears throat> urgent care called, supposedly the patient passed out, had two minutes of CPR, but is now awake and alert. You get on scene and the physician gives you a blood pressure, it was 80, heart rate was in the 20s. She was set 96%, breathing about 22 times a minute as you're walking up to assess the patient, all right? He hands you this 12 lead as well. So too fast, too slow, or okay. Too slow. First thing I think of, that's why are you getting an EKG on somebody with a heart rate of 30? It makes me uncomfortable, right? You should be taking care of the patient. But for academics, it's way too slow, all right? So I think of three things with slow rates. I think of drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia, all right? So drugs, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, they took too much as an overdose, or they took their normal amount and now their kidney function is off because they've been diarrhea, having diarrhea, GI problems, <clears throat> or worsening kidney function. Electrolytes, the only electrolyte that causes this is hyperkalemia. That causes a slow wide rhythm. So always think slow wide rhythms, hyperkalemia. And then ischemia, like a STEMI or an NSTEMI. Right. When I go back to this, I got enough data I can kind of look and lead one. AVO doesn't have much there. Six and five looks reasonable. I don't see any big ST elevation. Two, three and AVF looks reasonable. V1 through V4. I don't have anything in AVR that I can look at. So quick glance of this. I don't see a big STEMI. Obviously, I'm going to be repeating this and get a long rhythm strip to look at it better. All right. But drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. All right. I should be getting up to the patient pretty quick, doing a quick assessment. Ma'am, are you okay? Can you tell me what's going on? As I'm doing that, I'm checking a pulse to see if that correlates to the low heart rate. I'm feeling her skin for temperature. Is she diaphoretic? I'm checking mental status. I'm looking for obvious signs of trauma. Okay, did she pass out and fall and hit her head? Okay, my partner's getting her hooked up to the monitor. We're checking her SATs. I'm getting an AccuCheck, right? So if her glucose read high, I would think she could potentially be in DKA and that can lead to hyperkalemia. So I'm going down that pathway. If it reads low, I give her D50. That's probably not the case. If it reads anything else, I don't really care, right? So heart rate is in the 20s. Blood pressure is 80 by palpation. I should be go ahead and get an IV on this patient pretty quickly and start an IV fluids for hypotension, all right? Her glucose was fine. She says she's weak, but no chest pain. All right, as I'm doing that, we're going to put on the cardiac monitor. I'm probably throwing the pacing pads on her. I'm starting a second IV. I'm asking pertinent questions. Any health problems? Do you take blood thinners? All right, what medicines do you take? Are you allergic to anything? All right, I'm doing that all at the same time. And I'm also thinking about ACS, hyper-K, or drug-induced. Right, so EKG look pretty good. It can always be hyperkalemia. Maybe drugs. I'm listening to her lung sounds. I don't have signs of obstructive shock, like attention in the thorax. All right, nothing weird like that. We know she's not hypoxic. So the way we treat this is quick and easy stuff. So atropine, right? So atropine, old, the uh, old school drug, safe to use. If they have a high grade heart block, it's not going to help them, but it's not going to hurt them. That's good because every drug you give has a risk to benefit. There's a good benefit and limited risk for this drug. We just changed that to one milligram, all right? I like that. I don't do half a milligram. If I do half a milligram, they don't get better. I got to repeat one milligram. If I give somebody one milligram and they don't get better, I'm not giving any more, all right? Once you do the trick, it was going to work. If not, I'm moving on down the road. The next thing that we talk about, I always think about calcium. Now, this is Cat B in Alabama, except for cardiac arrest, all right? But a lot of the drugs that we give, the epi, the dopamine, all that stuff increases heart rate and blood pressure, does so by increasing intracellular calcium, all right? So if we give a bunch of calcium, it really works. There's limited risk to calcium in this bradycardia and this potential benefit, especially if I think hyperkalemia, all right? The next cat A drug we have is dopamine. Dopamine increases blood pressure and heart rate. For the folks that are listening in that work in the hospitals, we go away from dopamine for pressor support and sepsis and other things. We use levofed, all right, or other pressors, maybe an epi. But 
For bradycardia and hypotension, dopamine is the way to go. It fixes both of those. This is a titratable drug. You spike the bag, you hang it, you open it up, and you start calculating your drip factor, which can be 10 mics per kilo per minute, and you adjust up or down based upon patient response. Okay? Takes a few minutes to work. So I've given my atropine. I got IV fluids. Dopamine's going. All right? I'm reassessing the patient. My partner's already on control of the phone with med control. Hey, doc, I got a 40-year-old female who's bradycardic and hypotensive, no response to atropine or dopamine. I need orders for calcium and orders to pace, okay? So after this, I'm giving my calcium if I think it's indicated for hyperkalemia, and I'm going to start getting ready to pace this patient, all right? Pretty quick and simple. This all can take, uh, you know, four to five minutes to get all this stuff done, all right? History, physical, interventions all at the same time. So new protocol, we can give one of atropine. Sweet. Um, progression, this chick actually, I can't say it. This patient actually <clears throat> got some fluid boluses. She got atropine once by EMS. I gave her one of the hospital. Heart rate got better, but she was still pretty hypotensive in the 70s or 80s systolic. So she got calcium from me, even though I don't see peak T waves or wide QRS. Hyperkalemia can be slow and wide. There's a limited risk. She got calcium. We started dopamine, titrated that up to about 10 mics per kilo per minute, maybe a little bit higher. And we got increased heart rate into the 50s or 60s. Great mental status, good cerebral perfusion. She looked a whole lot better. This lady had been having some vomiting and diarrhea. She was on a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker. Her kidney function was off because she was dehydrated. So her normal medicines were too much for her. And that's why she got blocked down, okay? The other good thing about giving calcium to somebody is that lots and lots of people in the deep south have hypertension and we use calcium channel blockers to treat that so if they take too much of a calcium channel blocker how do we fix that give them calcium right so supportive care abc's right look for life threats atropine dopamine calcium getting ready to pace if i pace somebody i'm gonna be ready to intubate them fairly soon if i'm pacing someone you know that the c or their abc is jacked up so we get ready to manage the airway. They need aggressive airway management, all right? And they need high, uh, so, uh, pre-oxygenation or uh, pre-intubation. They also need capnography, you got it. If they become altered or obtunded, they need to be electively intubated. Big risk for that. What about blocks, people say? Don't really matter. So first three blocks don't hurt anyone. A first degree heart block in the setting of bradycardia makes me think hyperkalemia. All right. Second and third degree heart blocks. Yes, we need to know about those. These folks usually end up needing pacemakers. All right. But this is all academics. If I got a patient with a heart rate of 20 who is altered and hypotensive, I'm going to be treating the patient. All right. If it's a high degree heart block, this is not going to help them. This may help a little bit, but what they need is this. And if anybody gets paced, they're going to get a transvenous pacer anyway, just like these people. So this is academic stuff. You need to be able to recognize it, but patient management comes over trying to figure out, is it a first degree heart block, secondary type one or type two, or a complete heart block, okay? When we have the ability to go to CAT A for pacing, if you recognize, you look, oh, complete heart block, I'm not even going to try these other drugs. I'm going to pace right away because I don't have to call anybody. That's very reasonable, okay? Until then, I would do old school atropine, dopamine, all right? If somebody's calling med control to get orders for these other things, if you need them. So this was a 78-year-old male, uh, nausea vomiting the past 45 minutes. What do you do, all right? So we always think about heart disease, heart attacks, having chest pain. Really, this is only about 25%, 30% of the people that have this, right? All right, so you think about suspected ACS, acute coronary syndrome. So that could be a 78 year old male who is just weak. Maybe he has nausea, maybe he's short of breath, maybe he's just diaphoretic, all right? So lots of things, acute coronary syndrome, right? So 78 year old male, nausea, vomiting, weakness, shortness of breath, I don't feel good. Those guys get an EKG, they could be having a big cardiac event and we have ways to fix that. All right, so we get a 12 lead on scene, determine if this is a STEMI or no STEMI. We get in our history and physical as we do our ABCs in our exam. Appropriate things, I don't care about a lot of the medicines. I ask about risk stratification. 
Do you have heart disease, previous heart attacks? Do you have diabetes? Yes to those tell you he's high risk for cardiac problems, okay? Viagra, that medicine will mess with nitro for treatment for chest pain, very important to ask. Blood thinners makes a big difference, okay? As far as therapy in the hospital, if this is a coronary event. Recent cocaine use, cocaine is still prevalent in the deep south, can cause a lot of hypertension, a lot of issues. Some of the medicines we use to treat that can uh, react with the cocaine, we have problems. And then these things are screening processes in case they're having a big STEMI for our TPA that we've talked about. Dude's blood pressure is up a little bit, respiration's noted, all right? Does he look sick, diaphoretic, what's going on? This is his 12 lead. Too fast, too slow, or okay? I say that the rate is 300, 150, 170-ish, so rate is fine. I start looking at injury patterns. I do every EKG the same way every day so I don't miss something when I'm tired. So I look at leads one and AVL, and I'm already upset, concerned, right? I got big ST elevation right there and right there. So I've already met the criteria for a STEMI, okay? My mind is gonna keep going. I'm gonna look at five and six. I'm gonna look at two, three and AVF. I got reciprocal changes here. I look at V1 through V4, and then I look at AVR. I go back, I'm looking for PR interval, my QRS, my QT. And before I put the EKG down, I always look one more time at injury patterns, but I got enough data right now to say this is a STEMI, okay? So early 12 lead, that's being transmitted. I'm gonna start therapy. So we learned about Mona a long time ago. Morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin. Aspirin is the most important. This guy gets aspirin right now. The only reason he would not get aspirin if he says, I had an anaphylaxis reaction to aspirin one time, they had to cut my throat and breathe for me, okay? Everybody else gets aspirin. Aspirin jacks up the platelets so that this clot that he's having now, this STEMI, does not get bigger. If he says, I'm on blood thinners, I'm not supposed to take it. You'd talk to him about risk to benefit, that we know that, but we got to get this clot, keep this clot from getting bigger, okay? If he has gastric ulcers, not a big deal. We can fix that. He needs aspirin right now. If he said that he took aspirin before I got there, I don't believe him. I give him my aspirin, okay? Because if he took Tylenol or Motrin instead of aspirin, that's not going to help him, all right? So even when my patients show up in the ER, they said they took aspirin beforehand. If they're having a STEMI, I give them my aspirin. Now, if you give them my aspirin, you tell them I trust you. You know what an aspirin looks like, right? Sweet. So aspirin, nitro will dilate this vessel. That's why we talked about Viagra use, all right? Okay. I get IV access before I give aspirin, I mean, before I give nitro, because if I drop his blood pressure, you can have a bad event. So IV access, then nitro. Oxygen, we don't give O2 to people who are not hypoxic or complaining of shortness of breath. For the most part, we don't give them supplemental oxygen, but... The guy having chest pain and a STEMI, or just a STEMI, he gets oxygen for pre-oxygenation, all right? In case he goes into cardiac arrest in the back of the truck, you got your O2 on there. And then morphine we talked about earlier causes vasodilatation. So that's your Mona. Some people talk about Fona, which changes that to fentanyl. Fentanyl controls pain, doesn't cause bronch, I mean, doesn't call uh, vascular dilation, not really useful. Some people talk about doing Kona, which is ketamine. There's no indication for ketamine in acute coronary syndrome, right? We talked about O2. The other thing this dude needs, he needs defib pads. Biggest cause of death in a STEMI is cardiac dysrhythmia or heart block in the first couple of hours. This is just an EKG of a patient having a big posterior MI. The medic was great. Patient got an aspirin, lots of other good things. Got O2. He also put him on the defib pads. So when that patient went into V-fib, he just charged and shocked. And we got ROSC right there. All right. Had he not had the defib pads on the patient and the O2 on the patient, they're pulling the truck over, they're starting CPR, they're starting airway management, they're putting on the monitor. Way too much time. This saves lives. Not every chest pain gets defib pads, you go broke but every STEMI gets defib pads. And we've talked several times about the lytic checklist. It's in the protocol book. Technically, you're supposed to fill this out. I'll leave that there. I will say that you should get these questions and relay this information to the physician so that if they go into cardiac arrest, 
I know can I give them a lytic or not. Remember lytics, take that clot. TXA keeps that clot from breaking down. Lytics, take these clot strands and break them up. Do them all over the body. So if a patient had a stroke two months before, all right, and had blood clots in his brain, those clots will now break open. He'll bleed into his brain and die. That's why we got to know that, all right? If he had just had spinal surgery a few days before, same thing. Every clot in the body breaks down. Great for returning perfusion to the heart. Bad if you just had surgery, right? Sweet. This is that guy's cath. You can tell it was diminished through here. They go in with a wire, balloon this out, put a stent in it, and you get great circulation. And you think about the guy had a lateral MI. He was up in one in AVL, remember? So that should be a lateral one AVL. This is a LAD and the circumflex comes off that LAD. So it kind of correlates to the injury pattern that we saw. Oh, there's the EKG. And I'm going a little bit fast, but I want to get to a trauma case here in a second before we run out of time. This is another, I just want to say, attaboy, this was a patient that got early 12 lead on scene by EMS, picked up a STEMI, got appropriate care by both the transporting and non-transporting agency, got some great information that we can use, semi-inappropriate humor. All right, this is that guy's calf. You can tell he had a Big occlusion there, causing his problem, ballooned up. Cool things, the non-transporting unit got the appropriate EKG, got him in the system, which got the cath lab at the receiving hospital ready for the guy. They got appropriate history documented, knew he had some brain issues, brain cancer in the past. That's a contraindication to giving a lytic, because those guys are prone to having brain bleeds. They gave the right amount of medicines. They gave nitro. ALS did a great job, the transport team. All right. And we've been talking, that's Chief West's board's favorite video right there, show it every time. Uh, but the good things, I've been talking for about a year now, talking about that the feedback's coming, first medical contact to EKG and the first patient contact pre-hospital to cath lab. We're now recording that. They're pulling pre-hospital data, very important stuff. And guy got to the cath lab within 91 minutes from the scene which is fantastic, all right? So time is muscle. We get 90 minutes to get somebody from the ER to the cath lab. We got this guy from his home to the cath lab in the amount of time it takes us normally to do it. So you guys doing early EKG, sending that saves lives. Fantastic stuff, man. Mortar hornets, I guess those are gone now. We've got worse things. This was another EKG done by a different agency. They called it, dude had a big inferior STEMI. They put him in the system, got things going. We alerted our STEMI alert prior to arrival. Now, the goal here was different. We got 120 minutes. The reason being, guy was like 50 minutes away from the hospital. So he had like a 50 minute transport time. So we get an extra 30 minutes added to our goal time for that transport time. So he was 50 minutes out, got activated. We we're waiting for him at the hospital and we still got him in in 110 minutes, which is less than the regular time. So point being, you guys getting an early 12 lead, transmitting that gives us a chance to get ready at the hospital and it's saving lives, man. And the cool thing is you're getting recognized for it. So the cardiologists are looking at these numbers. These numbers are gonna be published it's going to be public data, just like a cardiac arrest registry, just like our infection rates and things like that. So the more y'all do, the better we get, the more they like us, the more ability to get feedback and maybe healthcare record integration. So this is fantastic for us. This is that guy's cat. All right, I got a few minutes to talk about this trauma patient. So um, all this information has been de-identified. I'm using uh, different photos, different things like that. Um, so <clears throat> this was a patient, uh, they were dispatched to report of an adult male with several GSWs. Uh, arrived on the scene to find a 21-year-old male lying 
right uh, position, alert several GSWs, clothing removed, rapid exam, trauma shears, rapid trauma assessment is at uh, Peyton Airway, decreased breast sounds on the right, there's a GSW to the lateral chest under the breast, GS to left lateral thigh pelvis, there's one distal into the belly as well, also had a hand wound, so multiple gunshot wounds. He had a positive uh, carotid pulse, but no peripheral pulse. That tells you what, that he's hemodynamically unstable. We have poor perfusion, okay? Probably hemorrhagic, right? Dude shot, all right? Weak in 30 pulse, he's cool and clammy, ashen, all right? He was in and out of consciousness. Uh, initial GCS was 14, all right? He was put in the system, moving to the local trauma center, all right? <clears throat> In route, blood pressure drops, heart rate increases. He's on high flow O2, got IV access. Then it becomes more altered. So now we got a guy that's shot multiple times, even in the chest. He is altered, he gets combative, drops his heart rate, he starts braiding it down. Now this guy, I'm not gonna think about drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia, I'm gonna think about what? Blood loss or obstructive shock, be it tension pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade, or just volume, okay? Medics did a great job. They called med control, got orders for chest decompression. They also got orders for some ketamine for sedation. Now, we don't use ketamine for sedation in the pre-hospitals, not in our protocols, but ketamine can be used for that. And if you talk to med control, this is perfect. Nothing wrong with this whatsoever. Excellent care, all right? Dude got chest decompressed, all right? We got documentation of increased SVO2, all right, uh, patient was then more obtunded. He got intubated. We got confirmation by entitled capnography and he gets to the hospital. So this is a very sick patient who got super care and really good documentation. So let's talk about what's going on. So we got a dude shot in the chest and the belly. When you think about being shot in the belly, remember anything below the anatomical nipple line can also be a belly wound and a chest wound. So right-sided wounds, you think about the liver is there, a very vascular structure, all right? A GSW there can cause a massive bleeding, all right? You can also think about a pneumothorax, all right? You think about structures in the heart. You got the bronchioles that can cause pneumothorax, big tracheal tears, issues like that. You got the mediastinum, you got the esophagus, which should be damaged. You also have the heart. This is a CAT scan of someone who's been shot in the chest. This white, is all injury, bruise, contusion, bleeding, all right? So even though this lung is up, that lung has been damaged and there's blood in there. Very bad stuff for the people. We talked about the diaphragm goes all the way up, look, above the xiphoid, up to the sternum. So anatomical nipple line. So you gotta think chest and belly wounds. GSW to the liver, lots and lots of bleeding. And those are just the ones on the right side. There was also a wound midline belly as well. And what runs there? The aorta. So a lot of issues going on with this guy. So we got a guy that's shot in the chest. He's gonna have some blood in there because of the injury. All right. But so GSW of the chest, who is now more altered, who drops his sat, okay. So we have concerns for pneumothorax, and now we have an altered blood pressure, I mean, altered mental status and low blood pressure. And just like in this video right here, Duke could have a tension pneumothorax. So appropriate, and now it's cat A, all right? Chest decompression. Very good stuff. So I'm gonna have my hands, I'm gonna find the clavicle, and I'm gonna go down to the next rib space. That needle is gonna go in. Once I pop that, I'm going to ventilate. I mean, uh, I'm going to pop that. I'm going to reassess. If it gets better, great. If he doesn't, I'm probably going to pop the other side of the chest because that bullet can traverse all the way across. All right. And the guy gets intubated. All right. Tension pneumothorax textbooks talk about you get tracheal deviation, you get JVD. Uh -uh. In the setting of hypovolemic shock, you're not going to see JVD. Tracheal deviation you'll see on chest x-ray or you see when you go to intubate the guy. You put the blade in the guy's mouth, you look, you're like, where are the cords? When you reach around and you manipulate that, you realize that it's pointing the wrong direction. That's when you see tracheal deviation. So clinically, attention pneumothorax is a pneumothorax with signs of tension, which this patient had. Excellent stuff. So guy was first tachycardic. 
dropped its pressure, became bradycardic. That is all volume loss versus attention in the thorax. We see you got some ketamine, fantastic to help his combative behavior. He was probably combative because he was hypoxic and period rest, but you still can't manage those kind of folks, right? He got IV fluid. If you look at the times on scene for this guy, they were dispatched. At, they were on scene within five minutes. They were gone within seven. He was at the trauma center. You couldn't get better times for this guy. So rapid on scene assessment, rapid transport, time is appropriate. He got appropriate care, chest decompression, all right? Things that we can do different now, we can add <coughs> TXA. So now we can give this guy two grams of TXA, all right? If we move into the hospital, may prevent other bleeding. In the ideal world, he gets blood. One day it's going to be at all pre-hospital places. We're not there yet. In the hospital, he gets blood, he gets packed cells, he gets a chest tube on the right side, he gets a chest tube on the other side, all right? This guy went to the OR, had an X-lap, got his liver repaired, a lot of blood products, ended up doing very fine, okay? But you could tell he was peri-arrest, he was almost dead, but the care provided actually made a big difference. So now, add the TXA. If you have time, I think the dude was also shot in the leg, if I remember right, you can throw a tourniquet on those wounds, nothing wrong with that, but quick trauma assessment, interventions in route, appropriate med control use, good chest decompression, Fantastic case, got me excited. Chief, you got any questions or comments on that case that I ran through real quick, trying to make up time? Or any, any comments in the internet world? Uh, we don't have any questions right now, but that case was interesting because of the timing, uh, all the issues we're talking about, the protocol updates seem to converge on one case. Um, those medics did not have access to TXA at the time of that call. Um, but I think that that would have been about the only thing that could have been done for that patient in addition to what was. Yeah, what no, was. I agree. I agree. That's the only thing you can do differently. And if, and if TXA was more than Cat A at that point in the game, but it is, it is now. And I think that um, it's a relatively cheap drug with a high benefit, a high yield. So I recommend if you're uh, not carrying it, that you do carry it. Um, you know, if you're a flight program or advanced practice and you have blood products, maybe not as important. Okay. Sometimes we still use it in the OR or the, in the ER with blood. Um, blood's the ideal thing. It's going to be tough to get, but TXA will make a difference, I think. I'll tell you, everybody um, is doing a great job. We're, we're seeing more and more recognition of STEMI by pre-hospital providers um, that I'm getting getting word of. So they're just the ones that I'm hearing about. I'm sure there's a lot more. The trauma, the issue of, of getting off the scene quickly for the trauma patients, <coughs> excuse me, and getting them to the surgeon seems to really be uh, taking hold. We're getting great short on the same times of rapid transport. Uh, there is one issue that came up um, that I, I would like to mention. It, it, nobody did anything wrong. It's just a clarification. Uh, when you have a patient who you know needs to go to the trauma service, but the patient is alert and oriented and is refusing to go to UAB, which happened recently, um, you know, get them to the hospital that they're willing to go to just to get them to a hospital. But even if you know you're not transporting them to the trauma center, go ahead and enter them in the trauma system. That makes transfer that patient much easier for the hospitals. Um, and uh, so I, I just run into a lot of people who didn't really understand that. So you can enter them in the trauma system if they qualify by the uh, criteria, even if you know the patient's not going to go to the trauma center if that makes sense. And it still helps the patient here. It still expedites the patient's care. Right. And it also helps us if, if I was working in the non-trauma center, that patient showed up and I explained to them they need to go to the trauma center. If they already entered, it's a lot easier to make that transfer. It's a lot faster uh, for the patient at that point in the game. So, yep. As, as far as what we covered today, it goes back to the thing, uh, the message that y'all been sending the whole time and EMS has been sending it's a total system right. from the, the first arriving ALS company to, to the transport agency to the trauma patients when we make the phone call early and let y'all know or the STEMI patients. Right. But all of that information moving quickly where the system's going to work. Right. Uh, and we have to practice that on a regular basis. And then in our resuscitation of either the cardiac arrest patient or the trauma patient, 
everybody's got a role and we need to really make sure that we focus on those roles and make those happen as quickly and as safely as possible. The medical patient a little slower where we can stabilize the patient in the field uh, a little bit better before we load them up and put them on the stretcher and then they code on us or versus the trauma patient that needs that ra rapid transport to the surgeon. Right. Right. So there's an individual role and responsibility and there's a system role and responsibility and they got to be working together. So like Chief was saying, the cardiac arrest on scene, you're going to work that on scene before you start moving. Right. The STEMI on scene, time is muscle. You don't have a way to do a cath down. If we get pre-hospital lytics, yeah, maybe we stay on scene and do that. But we don't have that right now. So those guys move to the hospital. Trauma moves to the hospital. But the guy with end-stage renal, flash pulmonary edema that we got to stabilize in the scene, we spend more time with those guys. Um, and early entry for STEMI and trauma makes a big difference because it gives us a chance for the hospital to get ready. And same thing with stroke. You know, Alabama has a great systems of management with STEMI, stroke, and trauma. A lot of places don't have that. When we're able to integrate our health care, it's going to be very good because now we can go back and look at all these STEMIs or in STEMIs. We can go back and look at our strokes and traumas and look at the pre-hospital data all the way to the ER, to the ICU, to the rehab, to the home, and get some pretty good information. So, All right, so next uh, in July, the what is the eighth July eighth? Dr. Payne will be here talking about pelvic and extremity traumas. He'll have some STEMI reviews. Uh, the next case, I think I have Dr. Rose come in from UAB as well. I'm trying to get a guest speaker, a physician every every time if I can, and then we'll get back on track. Uh, looking at 12 leads, reviewing left bundles or right bundles, uh, and keep talking about STEMI care. If you have questions or comments within reason, or reach out. Watch the uh, Facebook and the Brim's webpage. I'll be posting the Cadaver Lab and the sign up for that pretty soon as well. Also, we're, we're trying to get our videos posted to YouTube. Some of them are easier to edit up and post than others. So be patient, but you can check out our YouTube channel. There's lots of old sessions there uh, that you can watch and uh, kind of kind of go through the video. If there's parts that you didn't understand or you had questions about, you can always email Dr. Ferguson um, or you can email me and I can uh, transfer things to Dr. Ferguson for you. Um, but any questions, we'd, we'd love to get them. Any feedback, please be honest on the attendance form about your feedback. Is there anything we can do better or change up to make this more engaging and helpful for everybody? We're certainly willing to, to entertain those suggestions. And remember to get your certificate for today. We have great, we've had great participation in the last few classes. Got great participation today. Uh, the link is in the, the chat box directly to the form or you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com, which generates an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. And that's all I've got. If nobody else has any questions. Hold on, password. Oh, okay, password, good. So the password is BIAD, B-I-A-D, blind insertion airway device. Password is BIAD, B-I-A-D. Very good, thanks for reminding me of that. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. It will. It will spell correct. It will spell correct.